All right, so uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, we've been talking a lot about API design in the conference. Um, I hope you've, you've been taking good lessons out of it. I, I certainly enjoyed all the talks. Um, so we, we've been talking a lot about API design and standards. I think we can say enough about this. It's tremendously important, and we're going to continue talking about that here. What I'm going to focus specifically is on this part of API design that uh, deals with what we might call uh, modeling. So how we model uh, user flows through the API, how we design uh, user interactions through the API. And what I want to emphasize is how we can leverage domain-driven design in this process to help our, our job easier. So my name is Jose. I'm the uh, founder of microapis.io. I'm a com uh, consultant, author, and instructor. Um, I work with companies of all kinds and sizes, from small startups to big corporations like AIG um, and IKEA. I'm the author of this book over here, Microservice APIs, which is designed as a step-by-step -step guide to help you in the journey to building microservices and APIs following best practices and principles. Um, and I'm, of, uh, I'm also the creator of Fensa. Uh, it's very much in the beginnings of the project. Uh, the idea is to create an automated um, API security testing tool um, that is open source and available to everyone. So very much in the beginnings, can't expect much from me yet. But if you're interested in contributing, very much welcome those efforts. Um, I'm also collaborating with a startup called uh, GateRelio. The idea is to build um, an, like, kind of like a distributed compiler for APIs. So look at the code, compare it with the API specification, and see how accurate that is. If you're interested in this, ping me separately. I'll be, able, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Now, if you're interested in microservices and APIs, and I'm sure you are because you are here, um, and if you're interested in my content specifically, uh, you can follow my content on Twitter or LinkedIn. You can also subscribe to my newsletter on Superstack for Micro APIs, where I occasionally drop some of this content. Now, we're going to talk about API design, specifically modeling how we, uh, we're going to see why, uh, kind of explore the reasons why it is so difficult to get it right, what are the consequences of bad designs, and how domain driven design can help us in this field. So let's say from the start that API design is tremendously important for our APIs. If you check out the Smart Bear report of uh, state of software quality from this year, uh, nearly 40% of respondents are, uh, are willing to change providers if the API they are working with isn't easy to work with or, uh, or, or if the documentation isn't good. And this matches my own experience. Uh, I was recently talking to an organization, for example. Uh, they are losing customers. The, the organization offers most of its services through an API. Uh, customers are finding the API is increasingly difficult to work with. Documentation is increasingly out of synchronization uh, with, the, with the code. And as a consequence, they are switching providers. Now, what I uh, usually recommend in these situations is to switch the perspective. So to go from code first to a design first approach. Uh, we, we've heard a lot of, uh, about API first in the conference. We understand it's a kind of a loaded con uh, concept. So what I mean here specifically is the idea of um, getting an idea of what the API should look like before we actually start building it. And ideally, we document that somewhere in some form. Uh, so an API specification of some sort we heard about, I believe, is uh, type spec in, in previous talks. Um, so get an idea of how it works. This empowers developers, because suddenly we have very clear requirements of what we have to build, what we have to consume, and how to do it. But also, it is a great way to engage stakeholders in the conversation. Because what we are doing through, through the API is we are modeling user experiences. And especially for companies that offer products and services, mostly through the API, this is incredibly important. So be able to engage stakeholders, consumers, product managers into this process. And then ideally, we have a, a component here also of some sort of automatic testing of the API using tools like facet testers, schema thesis, and, and tools like that. Now, uh, API design is, is very difficult. We can agree that uh, API design first is, is the way to go. It's a good thing. But then we sit at the table. We start thinking about this, and it's incredibly difficult. A part of it is because we are designing user experiences. That's a very difficult job to do. But also, the raw materials we have to build APIs to design them are not easy to work with most of the time. So if we think about REST, we have uh, raw materials like URLs, HTTP, uh, HTTP methods, status codes, URLs query and path parameters. And we have to figure out how we put these things together to represent a user flow or a process. And it's not easy to figure out how to do that. Now, design isn't easy, but uh, the, the thing is also that APS represent our contract with the external world. 
uh, APIs encapsulate our internal implementation details. We can change functions and classes. We can swap languages. We can swap databases. As long as the, data, as, as long as the API is, uh, doesn't change, our consumers remain unaffected. They may even get some benefits out of those changes, but they don't have to change their code. The problem is when the API changes, and more specifically, when those are breaking changes, then the consumer has to change their codes to keep up with our changes. And this may happen because we introduce some improvements, because we introduce new features, um, and it's not a nice experience for the consumer. I, if we are adding just a new feature to the API, uh, that shouldn't necessarily have to be a breaking change. But a lot of the time it is because the original design process we follow at the beginning uh, puts us in a dead end uh, corner. It's not easy to get out of it without breaking uh, the API. Now, so a lot of this happens often because we follow a, a kind of inside out approach. So we have our system designed, implemented, uh, we have functionality in place, and we just want to get some API for that. So we have functions, classes, methods, whatever it is, they get their corresponding API endpoint. Or we have database schemas, and they get their own endpoints as well. So imagine something like a ride-sharing application. We may have a table for rides, a table for drivers, and a table for vehicles. And we put specific endpoints for each of them. Basically, what we're doing is kind of like an HTTP interface to the database. It's a kind of major anti-pattern here, really. We, we shouldn't be uh, tightly coupling our data model to the API. But it happens sometimes. And, and, and then we put the burden on the consumer to put all this data together. Now, this is, not, this is not only annoying for the developer as a consumer of the API, but it is also potentially a security risk. We are leaking more data than the consumer should be having access to. But also, we are opening the door for a kind of surface attack on the API. Suddenly, we know there are certain endpoints with certain IDs that we can try and play around with them and see what else we can discover. Some examples of what can happen when we follow this approach. This is from an actual FinTech API. Um, I'm not going to mention names. It's not a question of name and shame. It's more to uh, try to understand why these things happen. It happens to the best of us. So try to understand why it happens and how we can prevent it. But this is an, an example of it. And if you look at some of these mysterious endpoints, like item something, uh, so you drill down into those endpoints, and you see they are kind of re unrelated uh, topics gathered together under those endpoints. So one of them has to do with uh, using consent events. Another one has to do with uh, connected applications. Um, another one is the status of an item, and probably only God knows what that means. So consuming this application is not a, a pleasing experience as a user. Uh, we are pro probably even bundling together different uh, domains, which means if we have to make a change to one of these endpoints, we may be having to propagate those changes to different parts of our system. There's another concerning uh, aspect here. If, if you look at these applications get endpoint. Um, if you drill down into these um, endpoints, it's a specific type of application for a specific product. Now, in a financial context, we apply for different things. An application is something that has meaning in a specific context. So we apply for a mortgage. We apply for a loan for a specific product, like fast payments. We apply for a specific accounts, cl credit or debit cards. And so what happens here is we maybe only have one type of application offering at the moment. Uh, we put that in the top level of the API uh, specification, the design. Um, when the time comes around that we have to offer different kinds of um, products in, in, in this old company, uh, maybe we have to break the design, or maybe we have to do something here to introduce a parameter to understand what kind of application the user is doing. And that, that would be like the mother of, anti of all anti-patterns, bringing together unrelated operations under the same endpoint. Some more examples, uh, top-level endpoints for something like offers that are specific to, uh, to a specific product and even a specific application, a pricing endpoint that, uh, again, is this, uh, for a specific product and application, something like a merchant's top-level endpoint, which is, would be ideally reserved for, um, for a, a merchant domain to have uh, information about uh, different banking providers and be able to do things with them, but this actually returns customer data. So these are examples of dead-end uh, designs. We will have to change the, uh, the, the, um, the design if we want to expand capabilities in those APIs. Another example here, an, uh, an API that allows us to make payments. And what we're doing is we are uh, using the same uh, data model to represent input and output through the, uh, uh, through the API. 
Now, I wouldn't be even surprised if this data model is highly correlated to what we have in the database, meaning if we change something in the database, maybe, maybe something has to change in the API as well. Uh, this is inconvenient for users, consumers of the API. As consumers, we have to figure out what are uh, server-specific properties that we shouldn't be able to set. But it is also security risk. What happens if a user actually manages to overwrite those server side properties, change the status of a payment, for example? Um, we really want to prevent those situations. So if we change the perspective, if, if instead of going inside out, we go outside in, we engage with the stakeholders, with our consumers, with our users, with product owners, and we try to understand what we're trying to accomplish through the API. So the case of this ride sharing application, instead of offering specific endpoints and you just have to figure out how to put it together, we understand that as a user, you just want to get the status of your ride or maybe check what's the car that's going to come and pick you up. And so we design a payload that is specifically designed for this. It only contains the data we need and just that. So we are not ex exposing more data than the user should be having access to also. Now, the, uh, so this may be a good thing, but then how, how do you do that actually? How do you uh, structure this conversation with the stakeholders and, and how do you drive those conversations? There are different ways of doing it. A lot of teams are actually doing this thing without using any particular methodology. Uh, but something we can tap into is domain-driven design. It's a very well-established methodology to having for having conversations with the business, understanding user flows and, and processes, and modeling them in our software. So I'm not going to try to distill uh, domain-driven design in a couple of slides, but kind of uh, drawing some lessons that would be useful for APIs. The idea is to align the software with the business. Uh, part, of this is, part of it is understanding the language of the business and bringing that language into our software development process and representing that through the APIs so that when someone looks at the API, they can kind of figure out what we are trying to do in every operation through the API. Of course, as we, as we talk to the business, we're going to realize some of the lingo we, we use in business can be ambiguous. The same word may have different meanings. So there is an exercise here of uh, creating very precise definitions, uh, the process of building this thing we call a ubiquitous language, a language in which every word in a specific context has a unique meaning. And, and so the, the idea here is we are going to be able to have more meaningful conversations with our stakeholders about the requirements of the app. And then we apply this thing we call strategic design. So we, we try to um, identify the domains of the business. Uh, which, so we have a core domain, which is whatever the business has to do to drive value. So if it is a social media application, the core uh, domain may be feeding the timeline of the user with relevant publications. Uh, and then we have subdomains, uh, specific areas of the app, some things like managing user accounts, uh, user connections, having conversations uh, with other users, uh, publishing a post, managing the, the life cycle of a post, feeding the timeline as well. And, and so we map those to different areas of our application. There is a concept also of bounded context. It can correspond to a specific domain, can span multiple domains. This is a specific space of the application in which a word has a specific meaning. Very valuable for APIs. What we were talking before, like applications in the middle of nowhere, suddenly can have a very specific meaning. The same for offerings, for pricing, and so on and so forth. Now, to see how we would put this into practice, imagine we are trying to design an interface for an e-commerce application. So we want to model the process the user has to follow to be able to buy some items. We are going to simplify things here. Imagine we've had this conversation with the business to understand the user flows and the steps. Because uh, really, the, the point here is before even we start designing the, the API specification or anything like that, design here is more about understanding those flows and processes. And imagine we come up with these steps. So we have the first step, the user has to come to the catalog, search for items they are interested in, add those items into a cart, and then uh, proceed to checkout, apply coupons if they have any, calculate the final price, um, select a payment method, enter the payment details, send them to the server, we process the payments, and we, if the payment is successful, we return to the user with, a con with an order confirmation. Now we have to model those processes through the API, the first thing we might identify is that we have probably a few different domains. We have probably a catalog domain. We have something like a checkout domain, uh, the process of managing how the user is looking at those items and, and adding them somewhere. And we have probably a payments domain. And so the question now is, how do we model those operations? Uh, like, we say like we said before, right? We have these raw materials. It's not easy to put them together to represent a specific operation. 
Um, and some people might say REST is not even good for that. It's a resource-oriented type of API. You can't model operations for that. I've had these conversations with some people. But I think that's a little bit limiting way of thinking. We have to solve business problems with these APIs. We have ways to come uh, around those limitations by using heuristics. So the, uh, we leverage the semantics of HTTP. We know uh, POST is a way to create a resource. So we can think of uh, the, the process of paying for something is the process of making a payment. We create a payment resource. So there's a POST request for that. Um, the, the process of ordering something is the process of pla placing an order. We are creating an order resource. That becomes a POST request as well. And of course, we are, uh, I'm talking about the heuristics of CRUD. So the idea of mapping create, read, update, and delete to specific HTTP semantics and be able to leverage that in our uh, API design. Uh, what I think is that there's a subtle line between CRUD APIs and crude or crudified APIs. So APIs in which uh, we channel a lot of uh, resources, specific, specific operations um, through a similar endpoint, something like a put endpoint. Imagine here a file, uh, uh, file management API. We, we can change the name of a file. We can move it across folder. Uh, we can change the content. If we channel all those operations through a put endpoint or a patch endpoint, we are not really doing a good job at managing, uh, designing that API. Now imagine we, we've had these conversations with the business about coming back to the e-commerce example. And let's focus here on the, on the checkout process. So we have specific endpoints to, to manage that, uh, those operations. So we, went, we will have maybe a, a post cards endpoint where we can add items to the cart. We'll, that will give us a resource of the cart. We can update it. We can uh, pay through that. We can place claims, uh, arrange a refund. Uh, what we're doing here is also encapsulating um, operations that belong in different domains. So uh, like, like we said, right, we have different domains here, catalog, um, payments management, card management, um, claims management. And so we can encapsulate so, some of those operations for the user so that they don't have to go to different APIs and perform uh, those specific operations. So then we can make it more user friendly by encapsulating operations within a specific uh, resource hierarchy. Um, now, one, just one more word about uh, modeling those uh, flows across different domains. Um, the typical API specification is going to contain from, from dozens to hundreds of thousands of lines. And for a user, it's a little bit overwhelming. Think about the GitHub API. You come here, so many lines of a specification. What do I need to do to accomplish something with this API? So the, there's this uh, new initiative, the Workflows Specification. Frank Gilcomins from SmartBear is leading efforts here. What we can do here is we can define the steps that a user has to undertake to perform a specific action or, or to accomplish a specific goal. So in the context of the e-commerce application, we can bring the specific steps from different domains that the user has to accomplish to buy items to the website. Um, of course, the, the idea is this grows into a, uh, a well-established standard. Eventually, we have tooling here that we can even use to, to do some uh, kind of business testing in an automated fashion. Uh, so key takeaways, uh, design is hard, but it is important. Um, let's do an outside-in approach. We talk to the stakeholders. We try to understand the user flows and operations. We, are, we can apply domain-driven design to structure this approach and guide uh, how, we, uh, uh, how we do it. We, use it, we focus on user flows and operations at the beginning. We're not trying to get down into the implementation details of how if it is an endpoint here, an endpoint there. It's more about understanding those user interactions and then modeling them through the API. Product heuristics, useful, but not an end to itself. Workflow specification to model uh, the specific user flows if it, if it comes to that. Um, I'm running out of time, so uh, let's leave it at that. This is the end. Some readings here. Um, if you're interested in, in more material, uh, you will get access to the slides. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. Any questions or comments, I'm happy to answer now.